Okay. <clears throat> Aloha and welcome to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the festival. And I'm delighted to welcome poet Garrett Hongo, who actually started out, at, I think, in Volcano on the Big Island before he moved to the mainland, and <clears throat> where he's now a professor at um, Eugene, Oregon. And uh, also like to welcome Mari Yoshihara, who will act as the moderator. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to this event. Aloha. All right. Aloha Kako, and thank you, Roger, for the introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to, to moderate this session. Um, I, when this book became available for pre-order, I pre-ordered it right away. I read it with great interest, um, not only as a scholar of Asian American Studies, American Studies, but also a writer myself and um, also a music lover and a musician of sorts. So congratulations on this wonderful publication. Um, it's a big book, as you can see, and as you can see all my post-it notes, I read there are many, many parts of the books that I just love. Um, a book, the book is many things. Um, it's about um, Garrett's profound love and understanding of music of all genres, ranging from opera to symphonic music, chamber music, rock, blues, Hawaiian, etc. cetera. Um, and first and foremost, it's called The Perfect Sound. So it's about his pursuit, obsession and pursuit of the perfect sound through audio technology. Um, it's also about um, his education on race. Um, it's about Japanese American history. It's about longing, desire, um, loss and mourning. It's about place and home. Um, and it's a wonderfully musical book I found. Um, it makes sense that Garrett is an opera lover. I, I read it, the book itself is like an opera, I thought. Um, so we, we can talk about all of that. But before we get started on all of these themes, perhaps, I mean, Garrett is first and foremost a poet and not everyone in the audience may be familiar with uh, Garrett's poetry. So perhaps we'll start by having him read one of his poems. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mari. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's the first time for me. And uh, I'm glad it's my number finally came up at the at the book fair. This poem I'm going to read is a poem, an early poem I wrote um, about my father who had a harder life than I did and who made it possible for me to have mine. Um, he's a Macaulay boy. And uh, he lived through many things. This is a poem called What For? At six, I lived for spells. How a few Hawaiian words could call up the rain. Could hymn like the sea in the long swirl of chambers, curling in the nautilus of a shell. How Amida's ballads of the Buddha land in the drone of the priest's liturgy could conjure money from the poor and give them nothing but mantras, the strange syllables that heal desire. I lived for stories about the war my grandfather told over Hana cards, slapping them down on the mats with a sharp Japanese kiai. I lived for songs my grandmother sang, stirring curry into a thick stew, weaving a calligraphy of Canon's love into grass mats and straw sandals. I lived for the red volcano dirt staining my toes, the salt residue of surf and sea wind in my hair, the arc of a flat stone skipping in the hollow trough of a wave. I lived a child's world, waited for my father to drag himself home, dusted with blasts of sand, powdered rock, and the strange ash of raw cement his deafness made worse by the clang of pneumatic drills, sore in his bones from the buckings of a jackhammer. He'd hand me a scarred lunch pail, let me unlace the high top GI boots, call him the new name I'd invented that day in school, write it for him on his newspaper. 
He rubbed my face with hands that felt like gravel roads. Tell me to move, go play. And then he'd walk to the laundry sink to scrub, rinse the dirt of his long day from a face brown and grained as coal wood. I wanted to take away the pain in his legs, the swelling in his joints, to give, back, to give him back his hearing, clear and rare as crystal chimes, the fins and glass that wrinkled and sparked the air with their sound. I wanted to heal the sores that work and war had sent to him, let him play catch in the backyard with me, tossing a tennis ball past papaya trees without the shoulders of pain shrugging back his arms. I wanted to become a doctor of pure magic, to string a necklace of sweet words, fragrant as pine needles and plumeria, fragrant as the bread my mother baked, place it like a lay of cowrie shells and picake flowers around my father's neck, and chant him a blessing, a sutra. Wow, mahalo for sharing that. Um, it's it's beautiful and it's it's beautiful and moving. And I'm also very glad that you we got to hear hear your poetry. Um, not only read it because poetry is of course music, and you know that's that's what this book is about. It's about music and sound. And so it, I think it's very important for us to to hear your poetry. Now, so that poem is about your father and it's written from, I mean, it's about your father from your you as a little boy. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? And in this book, you also write a lot about your father because your father was the one who got you, you into this world of sound and uh, recording. But you're now writing about your father at an age where you are older, than when your father passed, right? That's right. Um, my so, father passed away when he was 58. Right. And I'm much older than that now. Yeah. So how, how was it for you writing about your father now? Um, compared, I mean, I know you've written about your father elsewhere too, but can you, I mean, yeah, first of all, maybe for the people who haven't read the book, um, just tell us a little bit about your father. What happened was um, I, I had gone to, Italy for um, uh, on a fellowship and um, during that time um, the consulate worked it out so I could go to a performance at La Scala the opera house in Milan mm -hmm. and um, I didn't really know anything about opera um, I'd gone to a couple one in LA one in DC and you know it was sort of okay um, one was Figaro I don't remember what the other one was oh La Forza del Destino uh, mm -hmm. uh, early Verdi and then um, so the, the guy said, is La Boheme okay? I had no idea what I was in for. And it just blew me away because the music is Puccini. It's so beautiful and the characters and the guy, Rodolfo, one of the leads is a poet. He, he, and then the, the, the lyrics of his arias are exactly like um, those of us who wanted to be poets when we were young, uh, what we aspire to, what we love, how much passion how much words meant to us and how they made us um, feel transcendent, you know, so beautiful. And um, it just tore my heart. And um, so I, I came back from Italy saying, okay, how am I going to listen to this opera, figure out how this art form works? Because anything that's that moving, I want to know about, you know, whether, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, jazz or, or, or roller skating. So I, 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 I said, I gotta, I gotta build a stereo system and listen to this stuff. And then I found that, you know, it was not easy to get a stereo system that could play opera because it's the most challenging music to play well for all kinds of reasons that I won't get into now. As I was going through that peer, the process, I happened to see a photograph of a tube amplifier and I thought I needed to have it. I don't know why, but I just, I, I, I had all these solid state things. So I got it. And as I was fiddling with it and settling it into my system, I started remembering all these things that I'd forgotten completely about when I was 10 and 11 and 
12 years old, my father would be making his own electronics equipments, tube amplifiers from kits. Mm -hmm. First, like a Heath kit, and then a Ico, and then a Dyna kit. And then I used to help him in the evenings, you know, because he was losing his hearing and he didn't, he'd make all these little changes, you know, change tubes, change a resistor, solder this, solder that. And then he'd ask me uh, what it sounded like, what the chain sounded like. So he only spoke Hawaiian pigeon, so I have to speak pigeon back to him. And I said, you know, this one sound kind of teen, you know, kind of what teen, teen, you know, that kind of teen kind of sound. Oh, oh, okay. So we like more fat. And I said, yeah, more fat. So he would fiddle with it and change the um, tube or change the resistor or whatever. And he says, how about now? <laughs> you know, and we go like this every other night, you know, and it was some, um, and as a 10 year old, 11 year old boy, I, I, I was so happy I could help him, you know, mm -hmm. and I hadn't thought about that in years and years and years. And when I realized what he was doing was he was trying to create these stereo equipment, the stereo system, so he could listen to his music for the last time because he was losing his hearing and he wanted to build these things so he could hear Glenn Miller and um, Harry James and um, Artie Shaw, all that big band music that he, he grew to love um, from when he was a kid in uh, McCulley. And then the big bands would come through Hawaii and he would sneak in to go hear them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, um, I just thought that was the most incredibly peaceful gesture mm -hmm. a person could do. And it just brought me into waves of feeling again. And so, yeah. and that was sort of the birth of the book. You know, um, my own obsession with trying to create a system, but also reconnecting with my father and listening for him. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, uh, having been introduced to acute listening from when I was very young, you know, um, I, I, it's been a, a great meditation ultimately. Yeah. 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 And yeah, what you just said about listening for him is, is very poignant. And you, t you kind of write about that, not only about your father, but, um, you know, kind of like Asian American history, like what it means to listen for the history or voices of people who didn't necessarily leave a whole lot of records of I mean, either literal records or records of all, all kinds. Well, you know, I also imagine my grandmother before World War II in her parlor in Laia. My maternal grandfather was a storekeeper in Laia and he had more things than some people. And so he had a, a little radio. Um, um, and then I don't know what particularly they listened to, but I know what kind of music they like. So I imagine my grandmother knitting or crocheting and, and listening to Rio Coca, you know, and um, what is it? called in modern Japanese music, kind of influenced by Western jazz, but also Minyo at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, it evolved into Enka later, you know, but in that time it was Rio Koka and a different kind of sound. So I imagine her, you know, there's a section of the book that I imagine her doing that too. It, it, it's a nice way to um, inhabit the, the life that um, is so distant in many ways from us. The sound is another dimension, another way you can imagine their lives. We can imagine the work lives of the plantation workers that my ancestors were on my mother's side in uh, Wailua and Kahuku, you know. Mm -hmm. um, my family is from Kahuku. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of now documentation about their, you know, there's the Horohorobushi that Franklin Oro translated. Right. Um, May you rest in peace. And um, we have so much now with uh, the resurrected history uh, mm -hmm. from all the different scholars who've, who've made it their business to learn more. Mm -hmm. But sound is another way to try to uh, imagine those lives. And, and that's one of the things I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, what were their songs like? What were their voices like? What music did they listen to? You know, yeah. and it's just a, a, a thing, you know. Yeah. yeah, and you also write quite beautifully about the relationship between music and music and poetry, which, like you know, totally makes sense. But the the what you 
what you wrote about like Coltrane and Whitman, like how you discovered. Oh yeah. 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 I think that's great. When I was, uh, I finished college, I graduated. Um, you know, I just never, I have never, under, I, at those times, I didn't understand Langston Hughes, Walt Whitman, or Emily Dickinson. You know, I was more focused on European poets like uh, Rania Maria Rilke and Jor Traco, and even South American poets like Pablo Neruda and um, Cesar Vallejo, you know, and the Spanish poets Lorca, Garcia, Federico Garcia Lorca, and uh, Gabriel Celaya, and this stuff like that. But the Americans, man, I got, what is up with this stuff? It seemed, you know, corny to me, like Stevie Wonder. And my poetry teacher was aghast. I had three of them who were wonderful. One was the jazz critic, Stanley Crouch, who, uh, you know, lessened me about Langston Hughes. Bert Myers just loved Walt Whitman, my my other poetry teacher. And he 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 said, one day you'll get it. He said, just do me a favor, take Whitman with you when you walk around Japan. I had a fellowship to go walking around Japan after I graduated, you know. I was going down to the Sumitomo Bank in Little Tokyo in LA to pick up my fellowship check. You know what I mean? Thousands of dollars, man. And I had a little pocket Whitman in my back pocket, even in the car seat. And I remember pulling it out, you know, one of those signet pocket Whitmans, you know, and on the radio, I used to listen to this jazz station in LA called Kago. And Coltrane's Equinox came on. And it goes like this. Da 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 he da 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 he da 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 be da pa da ma da 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 he da 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 he da 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 and all of a sudden I understood this is like Whitman because the 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 jazz sentence would have these minor but very, very consequential variations. Uh, you, as a musician, know what I'm talking about. And they give it a little jump, a little spurt of energy. And they change the, the tenor of the feeling and the rhythm, and then they, and they grab it back again. And I was thinking that's exactly what Whitman's rhetoric was, was doing. You know, out of the cradle, endlessly rocking, out of the mockingbird's throat. And and I went. That's what's going on. It's a mm. it's a music like Coltrane, and um, uh, it was like huge revelation. I understood. I understood jazz better, and I understood uh, free verse poetry better. Mm. As a matter of fact, because of that essay, it attracted um, uh, a great student that I to come to study with me because he he heard the same thing, but he didn't have the articulation for it and and uh so i got a great wonderful um poet to, as a student who's a very his name is major jackson he's now the director of creative writing at vanderbilt university and i'll see him next week mm -hmm. so um well, life comes to you in wonderful ways that's all i can say yeah. yeah and writing writing about music i mean not only about your musical interest and passion but actually describing music which i'm very bad at doing <laughs> even though i write about music and musical society actually describing piece of music is difficult i find but you do it so so wonderfully like i like i just want to i want to learn so much from you but um well it's like that hard for you is that something that you practiced well i had to describe music to my father and i think that's probably where uh, i, I start it started hmm. but you know music is also like a landscape or a seascape it's no different you could talk about its motion and its qualities, its shifts of tone and changes of rhythm in the same way that you might describe a, a landscape. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of like plein air painting or, um, you know, doing, a, I mean, I wrote these seascapes recently when I was in France of the ocean. And then I also compared them to the ocean at La Ie, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, writing about music is very much the same to me. It's just um, a different manifestation, but I describe it in words. You know, I bring it to language. I don't know of a specific passage. Were you thinking of a specific passage 
where I describe something? Well, it's all over the place. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a 500 page page, but it's all over the place. Um, yeah. I have too many post its to, to find. Um, well, maybe maybe there's something here where I talk about um, traditional Hawaiian music. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think I have something here. Uh, when I talk about the resonator guitar, which was the um, the Hawaiian mm. um, steel guitar, it was it was invented in L.A., but the first player of the resonator steel guitar was Saul Ho'opi'i, you know, who was a big star in Hollywood in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hawaiian music was very popular and they, they, he was the one who played it. Here's a passage where I talk about having first heard in my memory a steel guitar, a lap steel guitar. Mm -hmm. Here's a photograph of, of, I don't know if people can see it. And I'm trying to do, the camera won't pick it up. It's like a ghost page. <laughs> There's a photograph of Saul and his trio. Um, here, I'll read it yeah. and see if how I do. I think I first heard it live when I was a child younger than five in Kahuku, Hawaii, a town that neighbors Laie, where my maternal grandfather had his store, today about an hour's drive from downtown Honolulu. Then we were a more isolated plantation community made up of the descendants of Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, and Portuguese immigrants brought to work in the sugarcane fields, which were owned by descendants of white missionaries to Hawaii. Kanaka O'ivi avoided plantation work for the most part, but they were part of the community too. A few families with tons of relatives in neighboring Laie and Haula. Both towns were full of Kanaka O'ivi whose living came from a combination of farming, gathering from the sea, and working jobs outside of King Sugar. On Saturday afternoons, we'd gather at one of the church lawns to hear music that the Kanakas played, usually in trios and quartets, a contrabass, a ukulele, and two guitars. Everyone in the group usually sang, creating marvelous harmonies that I think I can still feel in my body especially on the high notes of a chorus. One particular day, though there was a different composition to the usual grouping in the quartet, instead of two Spanish-style guitars, there was only one. In place of the other guitar, there was a boy, maybe middle school aged, seated on a stool with a guitar sitting sideways across his lap. When the group started up, I saw his left hand gliding up and down the guitar's neck, holding something in it that seemed to slide across the strings. The sound he made on his guitar was that was like that of a yodeling tenor singing a beautiful Hawaiian language ballad. It was like a waterfall full of yellow flowers spilling across the mossy green face of the cliff in the Ko'ola Mountains. Um, and then I quote from Akaka Falls uh, by Helen Parker. The sound was so beautiful, I think I cried for the gift of having heard it. The Hawaiian steel guitar was like a human voice, quavering with mo motion in its highest notes, gorgeous throbs of music. At the age of five, I could have been devoted to that sound. But the moment passed quickly, the band launching into a hapahaole hole holo tune, based on a paniolo cowboy rhythm, the lyrics half in English, half Hawaiian, about a road trip around the island. Uh, old timers would know that song as Holo Holo Ka'a. Um, and the audience of villagers, parents, and children applauded in recognition and appreciation. Kanikapila, someone shouted. The throng joined in on the choruses, beating time with their hands that applauded and their bare feet that slapped and stomped the cool grass on the beat. So wonderful. And you do this, I mean, you do that for like throughout the book. And as it's evident from the book, I mean, your, your musical knowledge is just so vast. Like your, your, the genres, the genres of music that you have deep knowledge for, like by comparison, I feel like my musical knowledge is just like so narrow. Um, well, I have the advantage of not being a trained musician. 
so I can sort of um, uh, cruise around without commitment, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you seem pretty committed to me for all, all genres. But I think, I mean, is it true that part of the, uh, the reason for your breadth of musical just interest in the first place also comes from your upbringing? So you, you were, um, you know, you spent your childhood years on the North Shore of Oahu, but then you moved to, to Southern California and you grew up in Gardena. For those of you who are not familiar with Southern California, so Gardena is a historically heavily Japanese American neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, it has the highest population of Japanese outside of Honolulu. Right. And then you grew, you went to school in a very multiracial environment. Yeah, uh, Gardena so, was the first in integrated high school in L.A. Mm -hmm. And it was a third Japanese, a third black and a third white. So I went to school with uh, African-Americans and Caucasian-Americans. Um, and, you know, it was, though it was um, by population integrated, it was socially resegregated, you know, when I was there. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like that coming from Hawaii, you know. Mm -hmm. I thought, what the, what's the action over there? You know, I want to know what the action is over there. So I would, I, you know, I got to know black kids playing football and um, their music. We like, we like most Japanese kids like black music anyway, you know. So mm -hmm. um, I was in a like a doo wop quartet when I was in junior high and. Um, um, you know, I listened, um, you know, it was, it was uncool to listen to white music, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a Japanese or black, but I listened to like Cream, you know, and, and Led Zeppelin and uh, all the first hard rock bands that came out in those days in the 60s. Uh, I didn't mind being uncool, in other words. Uh, I even listened to the worst band possible. I listened to Buffalo Springfield, you know, uh, which were like cowboys, you know. <laughs> I remember that was shocking and distasteful to so many of my friends, um, my Japanese American friends. Um, but I kind of like shocking people and you know inspiring distaste. So I I, I liked it. I because of that music. I when in 1969 when Crosby, Stills and Nash came from Woodstock to play a concert at the Greek Theater, I went to hear them and Joni Mitchell, who opened up for them. And, um, you know, this is before they were big. And so I got to hear that music, um, Sweet Judy Blue Eyes and Joni Mitchell Live, who I'd only heard on records before. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. So so your kind of musical education was also, I mean, the way I read the book, it's partly, as I said at the beginning, it's partly about kind of your education on race and what it means to be Japanese American. I don't know if you agree with that reading. Well, but, yeah. you know, when I was younger, we were like ethnically Japanese, but culturally um, syncretic, you dig. We would go to the Bon Dance, but we'd also go to, uh, uh, you know, we do the Slauson and the Slide and all these black dances. And, um, you know, the Boogaloo and all these kind of things. It was all kind of this part of the same life play football, you know, um, listen to rhythm and blues, um, whatever. And then I go to the, the beach and listen to, I have to listen, I didn't like it, but I listen to surf music because um, <laughs> it was around the beach. Um, but I remember people questioning the music I listened to, you know, if it wasn't black, if it wasn't this or wasn't that. And it was along the lines of race. And I started questioning those things early on. Um, because I didn't feel like, to, you know, I wanted to make those kinds of choices. Um, and then I started thinking about it. And um, in terms of Japanese American identity, I don't think it was a big question for me existentially um, or even intellectually until I went to college when the environment was very different. It was largely white. Um, there are African-Americans there and many of them are still my friends. Bill Taylor, I wrote about in the book my friend who educated me in jazz, you know, um, he's from Compton, which is right next to Gardena. Um, Kev Mo was a classmate of his and Kev Mo, Kevin Moore is in the book. He's a blues musician. Um, each sort of group, black, white, um, even Asians from Asia had their culture. You know, they had something. And I, as a Japanese American, 
I did it. I didn't have that mm. claim. I couldn't claim these things because we didn't know very much about the Kanyaku Imin, the Issei and the Nisei. We didn't know. The war sort of cut us off from our hist historical roots mm -hmm. and the um, ferocious push towards economic stability uh, de-emphasized cultural preservation and, and oral history. So we were separated, you know, like my, my family didn't want to talk about the war. They didn't want to talk about what happened to my grandfather. My father didn't want to talk about being in the war. Mm -hmm. um, my uncles didn't like talking about Korea, you know, and so a lot of their formative experiences were absent from my consciousness, but they shaped who these people were in profound ways. I could, I could tell, I knew it, but yet they would not transmit that, you know, and that's what I felt as a young person. So when I was in college, I made a story up. I told myself my grandfather had kept a diary and he wrote in that diary and he wrote the daily, his daily life in it. And he wrote it in um, Japanese calligraphy. And it was like a myth I told myself. And it gave me the courage to try to become a writer myself mm -hmm. because it, otherwise I would come from nothing, you know. It was very important for me to imagine that. And I write about it in this, in this book. And it was a source of my confidence. Um, you know, when I met, um, I have extraordinary, I had extraordinary college classmates, you know. And uh, one of them is Louis Manan, the critic, uh, for the New Yorker and the professor at Harvard, the poet Brenda Hillman, who is a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, uh, Ray Youngbear, the Native American poet, the Sock and Fox Native American poet, um, Sandra Ott, who is the world authority on Basque culture. These were my classmates. They had something. Peter, Sh Peter Shelton, a sculptor. I needed to have something too. And to have it, I think, Rather than being from everything, I had to be something from something specific. So I made up the story that my grandfather kept this diary. And it was my confidence. And I never told anybody about it. But it's what carried me through my college years so I could write the poems I did. And, you know, after a while, I forgot that I told myself this myth. Mm -hmm. And it was only about 15 years ago that I came back to it and sort of confessed it in a story that now is in the perfect sound. Um, and it's about an older man, as I was, understanding of why I needed that story. Um, because the culture didn't give me that story. I need to, to create one. And rather than a story of, let's say, jingoism, you know, of political uh, absolutism, you know, you know, political absolutism, of times becomes that which people without stories gravitate to. I, you know, I, I'm sorry, but that's my view. Um, or religion, you know, M my story was historical. My story was like uh, culturally foundational. And it included things like Japanese calligraphy, Buddhist chant, a love of the sea, which my grandfather had, um, and the incarceration during World War II, and um, a love affair actually, um, in the cane fields that I made up. Um, this also, I suppose, is the impulse towards fiction. But, you know, Vico, in the beginning of the new science, Giambattista Vico, the Italian philosopher. I'm sorry this sounds scholarly, but, you know, I'm half, I'm half a scholar. If you, it's, it begins with the explanation of thunder. And what the men think thunder was, you know, it's the gods bowling or something like that. Mm -hmm. We make up stories to explain that which we do not understand for which we need to understand. Mm -hmm. And I made up a story to understand why we didn't have stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. Now, later and later, I, of course, start learning oral histories because of the oral history project at the University of Hawaii. Uh, led by uh, Michi Kodama and Warren Nishimoto, who became friends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Franklin Odo uh, with the Hore Horebushi and many other things. Um, um, 
but these were not part of my youth. They came much later after I accomplished my degrees, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back on it, it's with reflection of trying to understand why that young man needed that story. Mm -hmm. And all the whole book is all like that. It's why we need music. What is what what music? What is music in our lives? How does it console us? How is it our accompaniment? Um, you know, it's often said nowadays it's the soundtrack of our lives. But what that sort of means is it's ignorable. It accompanies. For me, it's the fundament almost. You know, the foundation of uh, our emotions. My key to learning Nisei and Issei history that was given to me by the playwright Wakako Yamauchi in Gardena, she sang songs for me. Mm -hmm. She would tell me a story about the Issei, the itinerant farm workers or the sharecroppers, you know, and then she would end it with a song she remembered. Yeah. And it was so moving. Um, um, and that's how I learned not just the facts of um, uh, Japanese American experience on the mainland in California, but the emotional tenor, the quality of the feeling. And Wakako gave me that through singing. Mm -hmm. I know and there's a chapter about that in the book too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. That was that was one of the most moving parts of the book. But there's one one other part of the book that I really want the audience to 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 learn about. Can you talk about your what? Yeah. The story of Alina, your encounter with Alina's father, because in terms of your learning about Japanese American, what it means to be Japanese American, I, I thought that was a very powerful and poignant story. You know, it's very complicated um, because it was my first love, Alina. She introduced me to poetry, um, to Joni Mitchell, yeah, and we were dating, and it was forbidden because she was white. And I was not, and uh, we were crossing, you know. So we sort of had to um, go to different places than our crowds would go. Uh, that's why the beach was so important for us. She also played all, all this terrific music all the time because her brother was in the service in England and he'd send back these 45s of all kinds of different records. So we'd spend time listening to those records, making out sort of on the couch. One afternoon, we got kind of involved as 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 people do. And her father came home early and surprised us, walked in on us, and instead of like totally exploding and kicking my ass, he just went into the kitchen and sat down, and we got straightened out. And she went to um, attend to him. And then he called for me to come into the kitchen. And I thought, I'm going to get it now. <laughs> and uh, it's a comical scene because I was wet. <laughs> uh, and I was wet because I had sort of gotten excited. And in order to calm me down, Alina went into the bathroom and got a, um, um, a hot water bottle or a cold water bottle or whatever. She filled it with ice and gave it to me. So I put it on my, she said, put it, put it on your, you know, Mr. Johnson and calm yourself down. So I did that, but it was leaking. It leaked. And I had to, you know, I had this, you know, um, wet pants, you know, and I thought, it's not what you think. It's not that it's not that, but I couldn't not go in the kitchen. I go in the kitchen with a wet, you know, fly. And I'm, I can't, I can't put my hands over because it'll look too obvious. So I, you know, it was just, I I don't know. I was just totally trapped like a fly in a spider web. And he says to me, would you like a beer? I go, what? A beer? What are you talking about? No. I mean, I'm yelling at myself inside my head. And I, I go, no, thank you. He goes, you know, son, why we live in Gardena? He's this big guy. I mean, he's this huge guy, kind of like a mini job of the hut, you know. And uh, I'm thinking, he's just going to swallow me with his belly. I'm going to be absorbed into his flesh. He said, I was in the war, you know. Uh, I was with a group of um, soldiers 
we were all from Texas. And we were cut off from the rest of the army and isolated and pinned down by the Germans. And they were picking us off one by one up in France in during winter. And we were all dying one by one. And we thought, okay, time to make your peace. He said, you could hear um, rifle shots going off all around them. You couldn't tell if there were shots or the tree limbs breaking off from the cold. And then after a while, these soldiers came up. First one, then two, then a whole squad. And the fighting had stopped. These were the Nisei, he said. They were from the 442nd. Do you know who they are? And I and I didn't. Oh, you didn't know. I'm 17 years old. I don't know, because people don't talk about it. That was the 442. I was wounded, and I had to recover. But as soon as I did, we moved to Gardena to be close to the people who saved me. What a story. Yeah. yeah. So I walked out of there thinking, okay, I'm saved. How come I'm saved? How come I'm not dead? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I'm 17 and I had to sort out all of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I did. Um, I wondered if that was the um, battalion my father was in. You know, I had all these questions popping into my head. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't ask them um, when I was 17. People wouldn't answer you because it was in a way uh, an erased or forbidden or canceled or complicated history. Mm -hmm. But, you know, little by little, um, of course, we found out what all that means, particularly because Danny Noe was in the Senate, you know, and the, his story was known. Right. And then Spark Matsunaga. And once those guys got in the Senate, a lot of people learned out, even Japanese Americans who didn't know about the 442nd, we all found out, you know. Um, I guess the young people today don't know how um, under wraps all this used to be and how um, policed this knowledge was. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a teaching uh, African Americans were forbidden to learn to read. You know, we were forbidden to know our own history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's a related, uh, related to this, what we're talking about, there's a question from a member of the audience, a very important musician in our community. Um, in regards to racial equality, do you feel we are moving forward or backward? It seems, <laughs> it seems that there was a sense of hope in the 60s that is no longer with us today. I mean, even before today, so Alina's father moved his family to Gardena because of this story that you just shared with us. But then later on, they had to they had to move, right? Because of she was persecuted for for dating me. Yeah. By um. You know her her um, her group. Um. Well, you know it's various. Um. I'm discouraged for the most part these days. Mm -hmm. And it's very complicated. Um, I think people are like, I talk about how we were resegregated at Gardena High School, even though we were celebrated as the first integrated high school. I think people are more comfortable resegregating. And that's unfortunate. They're not informing themselves of each other. And there are all these forces that um, make cowards out of people in terms of the exploration. Like this belongs to me, it doesn't belong to you. You can't, you can't touch it, you can't have it, you can't represent it. So people feel like shying away. Um, you know, I was at Dartmouth uh, last week on a memorial symposium for my one of my teachers, the great poet Robert Hayden, an African American poet who was canceled for not being black enough during the 60s mm -hmm. um, by Amiri Baraka and Haki Madubuti and the Black Arts Movement, um, very infamously 
cancel. One reason he doesn't have a lot of black students, former black students is because of that. I was his student and my friend Michael Collier was as well. Um, we have to be more courageous in coming to know each other and knowing that we can benefit like Yo-Yo Ma has the Silk Road Ensemble. That culture is such a, a, an exchange and a travel. It's not a property. I know people want to say it is and they want to claim it is and they want to fight us, fight me for not for saying it's about exchange as opposed to ownership. But culture is not ownership to me, you know. And race relations um, to me begins with sharing culture mm -hmm. and enjoying each other from that. I mean, I, I know a lot about so-called black culture, but it's American culture to me. You know, it's a culture I grew up in. Um, one of the poets, a very illustrious poet of Dartmouth, said to a friend of mine, who, who's a Jewish American poet, after I read, you know, he's secretly black. Mm -hmm. And then my friend said, I don't think it's a secret. My own teacher, Stanley Kraut, said famously, if you watch a white man and a black man from 100 yards away walking down the street in Harlem, they're going to look the same. They're both going to have the rhythm of the streets and the way they walk. You know why? If they don't, they'd be dead. <laughs> it has to do with the recognition of culture within the body. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also what Federico García Lorca said about Duende. It comes up from the ground through your heels. You have to feel it. Um, we have to feel it and enjoy each other. Um, and not be afraid or policed. And I do feel that that's going on quite prevalently nowadays in um, intellectual culture, um, but also enclave culture, enclave societies. Mm -hmm. Smaller societies are how culture is preserved and perpetuated. It's not how it's shared though. My mm -hmm. own grandmother was a dance teacher in um, uh, Honolulu. And it was sort of, you know, the old school system where you have this group and you practice and you perform for each other. But the major event would be the sharing with the community, you know? Um, and she never forgot that, you know? It was about sharing the the Nihonbyo uh, with the, you know, with the people. Mm -hmm. And it meant everyone. And it, it didn't mean just the people who were the parents or the dancers or the Japanese, but everybody, you know. And, and that's sort of what I think. That kind of thing is harder and harder these days, I know. I've mm -hmm. seen it. Uh, people are both A, afraid, and B, angry. I see much more of those two things. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I can't be more encouraging. Who is the musician who asked the question? Um, I don't know if it's okay to say, is it okay to say? <laughs> the, the person who asked the question is actually the concert master of Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Ah. Uh, yes, himself a very multicultural person in his upbringing and his, his musical interest and passion. Plays symphonic music, of course, but he also plays tango and Anka Korean and all kinds of music. So. I hope you can meet someday and talk over. I hope so too. Yeah. Um, let me ask you one final, uh, since time is running up, so I'm going to kind of lump a few of my questions together into one final question. Uh, a different kind of question. So this book is called, the, type, uh, the subtitle is called A Memoir in Stereo. So I want to talk about that, like why a memoir as opposed to say a life in stereo or autobiography in style. So, so one, Part of the question is about memoir as a genre. Well, one of it just involves a kind of an arcane answer. I want to call it uh, an autobiography in stereo hmm. because of famous autobiographies that I like. The autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, hmm. the education of Henry Adams, um, the autobiography of uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin, sort of the 18th, 19th century tradition. But my editor and, and the publicist all thought that was a total downer. We, you can't do that. So I, I said, okay, memoir. Why it's in stereo is because 
it's two stories. It's one, the story of my obsession through these electronics, the reproduction of music, but also is the story of um, the love of music and my family, um, you know, my father, the Japanese American story, and my quest to be a poet, you know. So there's those two tracks. One is just, you know, like audiophiles, they get frustrated because what's all this stuff about you? I want to know about gear. I want to know about how to build a better stereo system. It's all this stuff about, you know, they get very impatient. All the reviews on like, what is it called? Uh, Amazon. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and then the other ones, they, they love all that stuff, but they go, it, reading about all that gear is a little daunting, you know. Um, so that's why the, the the subtitle is what it is. Mm. Yeah. How do you how do you maybe this is too big of a question for eight minutes, but how do you approach writing prose and poetry differently, or are they? Oh, different? they're both very hard and very different. Um, you know, for the longest time, I couldn't write this book because I was living it. Mm. Um. And as it's a memoir, you have to have certain kind of retrospective uh, position with the material. And it wasn't until I got that that I could write it. Um, for the longest time, it was simply an obsession with stereo. And I didn't have the emotion um, because it was a mystery to me. And like I say, the beginning of its unfolding was realizing these memories about my father, you know. Um, and that sort of was the key, you know, the emotion and the idea of retrieval, in some ways, resurrection, you know, um, by listening to music, I bring my father back, you know, um, he was a very gentle man, um, very much not like me. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's all about the kind of involvement with, you know, the rhythms of things, you know, it's the pulse of life. I don't know. Um, and in prose, it's a different, it's a slower pulse. It's more patient. It's more, um, there's more flotsam, you know, there, there, there's data, there's information, there's background, there's narrative, there's history. There's all these things that are part of being able to tell a story. And you need all these things in order to bring the story together. In poetry, it's the song, you know, and it's also the focus of emotion. It happens much more quickly. There's much more focus and there's much more intensity. It's not so much that each word matters, but it's the way the words flow and hit, you know, they come at a different pace. Um, They come with a different force almost. Um, uh, like I'm, I was trying to finish this book of poems recently this summer, and I still had a nonfiction hangover because <laughs> I was trying to tell stories that were better suited for nonfiction of the perfect sound, you know, cause I, I haven't gotten past it yet. Um, um, it was easier to write, as I say, seascapes and landscape descriptions than to write narratives because narrative was so much involved with the person with the perfect sound so my narrative poems failed but my lyric poems were fine uh, because it's a better cleaner separation the hard thing is separating out what you can tell in say memoir nonfiction, and what you can tell in poetry yeah. you know it's it's sometimes for me it's 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 difficult it's a mystery and often my writing fails because i haven't um committed uh, uh, enough to one genre or the other. Mm. Yeah. It's not easy. Um, I don't know too many people who do both things. Right. Um, In fact, like nobody. (laughs) You know? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, shall we close by hearing one one other poem? So that we Um, can see the example of what you... I want to read from the book. Let oh, me okay. read from the book. This yeah. is, I, I hope we have time for it. This is a poem yeah. about a moment in childhood um, in, in Kahuku mm. that okay. I love. And it's a memory that came to me as I was writing the book. 
That's what's good about writing is all these memories come in as you work. As you work, this is called Herbie's Mouth. I might have been five when my cousin Herbie Shigemitsu did a memorable and astonishing thing out near the Japanese graveyard by the piggery on a sandy promontory in our home village of Kahuku on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Herbie was my elder by several years. He was 11 or 12 then and was impressive to me in every way. For one thing, like an adult man, he wore large aloha shirts and khaki pants rather than the t-shirt and shorts that I did. His clothes rippled in the trade winds as he smiled and reached into a shirt pocket and pulled out a pack of chewing gum, a speckled cowrie shell he'd found on the beach, or a cellophane pack of dried cuttlefish he'd share with me and his other young cousins. For another, he thought up our games and adventures, leading us in raiding the piggery of a few piglets he'd grab from their pen and stuff under his shirt as we trotted behind the sandy roads that wound through our village, eager to witness what he'd do with them. Would he pet them or eat them? Would he let them go in the cane fields? But he only wanted us to hold them, to see a squeal and giggle as the tiny animals, smaller than cats, wriggled in our hands, eyes closed, nudging their wet noses against our flesh. Then he gathered them all up, dropping them back inside his billowing shirt like it was a large marsupial pouch and raced back to the pen where he straddled its sides like a colossus <clears throat> and lowered each piglet back into its bed of straw while its huge mother grunted and squealed in anger below his legs. To me, cousin Herbie was a titan who breathed fire to my life. One afternoon, I think we younger kids were playing on the carpet of pokey temple grass amidst the stones and wooden grave markers in the graveyard where two generations of our ancestors had been buried. It was on a sand spit that jutted out into the Pacific and the winds whipped around our bodies in whirling blasts of cool air that seemed like ghosts coiling around us in the otherwise constant subtropical heat of our island. Herbie was over by the wooden fences of the piggery, about a baseball field away, and I saw him bring his hands up to his face and make a kind of cave of his fingers and palms surrounding his mouth, and then I heard him, Garrett, Tommy, all you guys, quick you come, come now. He waved then, knowing he caught our attention, and we gathered up our things, marbles, slingshots, paper targets, whatever, and ran over to him as he peeled away, headed toward the main part of the village, where there was a gas station owned by one of our aunts, a grocery store that sold us our treats, and our great-grandmother's shack with her garden abundant with papayas, squash, and melons. We obeyed his beckoning without question, his call for us to gather and follow him. And the astonishing thing was, We'd heard him through all that distance and buffets of wind. His voice carried from the piggery across sand dunes and covered in sea grapes and the emerald hillocks of the graveyard to our ears. How did he do that, I thought. How did he throw his voice so far? I could say now that what Herbie made out of his cupped hands was a small acoustic amplification device. It altered the relation of his voice to the air so that the compression of the sound waves he made by shouting was increased. At the same time, the volume of air it immediately had to push was made smaller. His cupped hands had restricted the wide field of air from the infinite universe around him to just the amount inside the cone of his hands. He changed the ratios of sound wave compression versus the resistance of the air volume it had to pass through. Simply put, his hands made a megaphone around his mouth. He made an air bomb of his voice and a launch pad with his hands. In the audio world, this is known as a compression horn. Of course, I had no understanding of this at the time. It was plain magic to me. And when I asked him how he did that, 
He simply said, he yelled into his hands, Ladat. Ladat, I asked, just like that. And I tried it, holding my hands in a basket around my mouth. The sound just rebounded back to my face. No, he said, no make one basket in front of your face. Just make one tunnel like that, open them out and at the outer end. He showed me again, launching his voice through his cupped hands into the swimming air, backing up farther and farther away from me. Garrett, Garrett he softly cried, letting the horn of his hands amplify his kind voice. Now you try, Herbie said. In the days that followed, we younger kids practiced shouting at each other through the tunnels of our hands, from opposite sides of the graveyard, from one tip of the little cove on, one, on the side of the promontory to the other. Hey, Tommy, you can hear me now or what? Hey, Garrett, hear you. More worse, I can smell your dirty mouth. <laughs> we teased each other with insults, gradually lengthening the distances between us, bouncing from sand spit to cane field, standing beside a row of ironwood trees, and shouting down the dirt road that led to the dump, where we found a cache of Army K rations, saying fouler and fouler things until an adult or teenager would hear and start scolding us and we ran away laughing, marveling at our new powers, our ability to send our voices across the landscape like the curling winds scouring the sands and making scallops on the waters of the ocean that surrounded us. Thank you. That's wonderful. I have so many more things that I want to you can talk about, but since time is up, so we'll just say, Roger, <laughs> your turn. Oh, that was a quite wonderful, uh, uh, could have listened to another uh, very happily. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so uh, aloha attendees, and thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, I think this was a quite extraordinary experience and you'll be able to Enjoy it again because it was recorded and you will have access to it on our website or in the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series YouTube channel. And uh, I just have one uh, final message, which is we very much hope to be in person next year and uh, which will take some extraordinary uh, efforts and fundraising, which we're already embarking on. And I'd like you to put into your calendars uh, a fundraising event um, with a quite extraordinary pianist, Alpin Hong, uh, on January the 26th, 2023. Hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you both, Roger, Mari. It was wonderful to meet you both and speak.